I don't think that the current landscape is adequate for insider trading. I think that there definitely needs to be like on point statute that clearly defines insider trading, hopefully in a way that could encapsulate the different classical theory and misappropriation theories and then some form of like outsider trading. But there's definitely a, a, mor- a morass of different legal opinions that make it way too confusing in its current state. Legislation changes month to month, year to year. But over the last century, the changes have been astounding. Join Karen Woody and her students from Washington and Lee University to dig into 100 years of insider trading law. Welcome back to Classroom Insiders, the podcast where we are walking through the evolution of insider trading regulation and theory. My name is Karen Woody, and I'm the host of this podcast. I'm also a professor at Washington and Lee University School of Law, where this podcast is being hosted. Today, I have an excellent show for us. I have one of my students here as a guest, Andrew Pampa. Andrew, introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about you. Hi, I'm Andrew Pampa. I'm a 2L here at Washington Lee University, originally from Connecticut with a background in economics and finance. Undecided on my career path, but very interested in securities regulation and particularly insider trading. Well, good. Well, I'm glad you're in this class. Has this class changed your idea about insider trading, whether or not you actually want to pursue securities law? If anything, it may be more interesting, more interesting to me, just because getting more familiarity with it shows what doors there are, I guess, as far as opportunities in the legal field for getting into securities regulation. Definitely. And as we have seen over the course of the semester, insider trading is very much a dynamic area of law, one that is seemingly always moving around and there's still always a lot of work to be done for lawyers in this space. So given that, let's jump into where we have left off in this podcast. As listeners know, we have sort of walked through the past nearly this century of insider trading evolution, starting with before the Securities Acts were enacted, and then sort of over the 60s, up until Justice Powell's jurisprudence, reshaped a lot of what we now understand as insider trading structure and regulation. Today, we're going to pick up a little bit where we have left off with this idea of the misappropriation theory, which originally got its first sort of light of day in the Chiarella decision that Justice Powell wrote. Andrew, what do you know about that opinion and specifically maybe what role misappropriation theory played, if any, in that case? Yeah, so uh, in Chiarella, the majority position actually does not get into misappropriation as it was never reached or given to the jury in the original case in the lower court. However, in Chief Justice Berger's dissent, he does say that he believes that there could be liability premised on a breach of duty of confidentiality by virtue of Chiarella's relationship to his employer, a financial printer, and the use of confidential information regarding company takeover bids. Right. Okay. And I guess we'll get some more clarity as we look at the two other cases where misappropriation theory is discussed and brought up and then finally sort of blessed, if you will, by the court as being a proper theory. But what is your understanding of what makes misappropriation different than the classical insider trading? So a classical insider trading, the the classical theory, liability is more so premised on a breach of a fiduciary duty. And from someone who might not fully understand the law, that's like your typical corporate insider, someone who works in a company, has access to the confidential information of that company, and then trades on that information. However, misappropriation theory is more so premised on this breach of confidentiality in a way that it encapsulates people who would be deemed corporate outsiders, whether that be through a company relationship where they aren't actually working at the company in which the confidential information is coming from, but there's a relationship there where they either to their company working with that company or through some sort of business relationship have a 
duty to keep that information confidential and through misappropriating it, they find liability. Okay, great. All right, well, let's look at the first time maybe it was in, before the court, even though we saw it a little bit in the Chiarella case, but as you pointed out, misappropriation theory, meaning a breach of a duty of confidence outside of the breach of duty to the company in which you are trading, if you stocks you're trading, the next time we see this come up to the court somewhat is in the Carpenter case. And I think that case is an interesting one because of the role our esteemed alumnus plays, Justice Powell, in that, or the lack of his role. Tell us a little bit about the Carpenter case as it sets the stage for misappropriation theory winding its way up to the court. So in the Carpenter case, there was a reporter who worked at the Wall Street Journal and specifically on a financial news column called Her on the Street. And the day before he would publish the new column, he would pass information on to Carpenter, the named defendant in the case, who in turn would also pass that information on to stockbroker uh, Felis. And they were basically front running the article press because, and they knew that it would move the market in such a way that they can make money off it. Ultimately, I believe they made around $690,000 from trading on this information. And the result was the SEC went after them for insider trading premised on misappropriation theory. And the SEC successfully argued in the lower court that their misappropriation of information and by virtue of their breach of duty of confidentiality to the Wall Street Journal through the agreement, the confidential agreement that the employee signed with the Wall Street Journal was enough to find a violation of insider trading. And the defendants then appealed to the Supreme Court and were initially denied cert. But Powell wanted to hear this case so bad so he could reject misappropriation theory that he had drafted dissent from the denial of cert and started to pass that around to the other Supreme Court justices. He was eventually able to convince Chief Justice Rehnquist and Justice O'Connor to join the dissent to grant cert. And they were went forward with the granting the second time. However, due to some health concerns, Powell ended up stepping down before the case was actually argued, which ultimately led to a split decision on the court. And so what did the split decision, what effect does that have? So the split decision, the decision from the lower court was ultimately upheld, but there was no precedential power of the decision. So in that regard, they didn't confirm nor deny whether misappropriation theory was good law, I guess, as far as from the highest court in the land. Right. So they split on the 10b-5 charge for Carpenter. They did. They were unanimous on the mail and wire fraud charge in Carpenter, which is a separate issue, which we discussed briefly in a, on a couple of these podcasts. But we don't need to dive into that as much today. If Justice Powell had remained on the bench, we might have seen the death of misappropriation theory entirely. And he certainly suggested that much with his memo about why they needed to hear that case. So that's an ironic sort of watershed moment where he gets the court to hear the case. And then in some ways, they default to allowing misappropriation theory to stand, albeit weekly, sort of just by default of the Second Circuit's decision. And then about a decade later, the court gets another chance to hear whether or not misappropriation theory is valid. What case finally decides that we will have misappropriation theory sort of for good now. Oh, uh, yeah. So O'Hagan is the case that officially cements misappropriation theory. So in O'Hagan, O'Hagan was a partner at the law firm Dorsey Whitney in Minneapolis. And at the time, Dorsey Whitney was retained by Grand Metropolitan, which is a London-based company, who at the time was looking to make a takeover offer of Pillsbury. While Hogan was not directly involved in the transaction, he had learned the information through other people at the firm and began purchasing Pillsbury stock and call options. And when he learned this information, it was like August 1988. I believe that by the end of the next month in September, he had owned more Pillsbury stock and Pillsbury options than any other individual investor. So the SEC brought him on insert trading under 10b-5 and... The Eighth Circuit ultimately held that misappropriation theory was inconsistent with Section 10B because there was an absence of a fiduciary duty, as Hagen didn't have a fiduciary duty to Pillsbury because there was really no connection there. I mean, 
the firm had represented Grand Metropolitan, but there was really an absence of a connection to Pillsbury. But the SEC had brought the case to the Supreme Court and they said, while he cannot be charged on a classical theory of insider trading because he's not a corporate insider, there was a relationship of trust and confidence between him as a representative of the law firm and Grand Metropolitan. And basically cemented misappropriation theory as complementary to the traditional theory of insider trading, holding that corporate outsiders breach the duty owed to the source of their information, thus cannot trade on that information. So what's interesting about misappropriation theory is that there still is a requirement that the conduct be deceptive and that there's some idea that the person is rooted sort of more in the in the old school fraud understanding that you've deceived someone that there's something that you're not telling that person with whom you're transacting and now again although we've stepped somewhat away from this duty running all the way to the transaction to some party in the transaction now we have a duty of confidence to what is the source of the information so meaning you've somehow gotten information inside information from somewhere and even though that person might not be either who you're transacting with or the company in which you are, you know, you're trading stocks in that particular company where the insider is, you are able to use that inside information and trade on it. But it still requires this breach of the duty of now, of, as I say, of confidence. So that notion of deception still being required plays into what we'll talk about a little bit today. And so after O'Hagan, we see misappropriation theory being, again, sort of cemented into the law, as you said, via that Ginsburg opinion. Now the SEC can run with this theory. But there's still a decent amount of confusion around where we are in terms of where the breach of duty has to be. So the SEC ends up passing Rule 10b-5-2 in the interim before we get to the cases we are going to talk about today. What, Andrew, is your understanding of 10b-5-2? So 10b-5-2 essentially enumerates the duties of trust or confidence that would be required to bring an insider trading case under misappropriation theory. It lists three, but also leaves the door open to kind of like, among others, wording regarding any other relationship where such uh, trust and confidence exists. But the three that it maintains are in situations where a person agrees to maintain information and confidence in a relationship where there's a uh, history or pattern of sharing confidences and in familial relationships such as a spouse, parent, child, or sibling. Okay, so we see, again, misappropriation theory is somewhat new from late 90s in the O'Hagan case, and there's obviously a decent amount of confusion. So this rule, in theory, is trying to clarify some of that. But again, some of these are not necessarily super bright line rules or this facts and circumstance test about whether there's a history of sharing confidences such that someone would expect the information to be held in confidence. There is, however, the bright line rule about relationships and familiar relationships as being a presumption of meeting this test, which in my mind doesn't seem wildly different than even the Dirk's presumption for close trading relative or friend. So those things, you know, maybe aren't moving the needle too much. But we do see some real challenges to this concept. And today, you and I are going to talk about just two quick cases that are more recent, where we still see a lot of confusion around definitions of insider trading, definitions of what it means to hold things in confidence. And so I wanted to chat with you about, first, I guess, this SEC versus Cuban case. Tell us about that, what happened. That was obviously a very that got a lot of press for obvious reasons. Maybe just Mark Cuban alone gets a lot of press, but there is it is also posed an interesting new wrinkle in terms of how we understand misappropriation. So tell us a little bit about that case. So in the Cuban case, Mark Cuban at the time was a large minority stakeholder in a, a internet company called Mama.com, basically functioned like a search browser akin to Google. And the CEO of this company had contacted Cuban about a company decision to raise capital through a pipe offering, which is essentially uh, the company decides to sell stock below current market value in order to raise capital. And this pissed him off a lot because essentially what this offering would do is dilute his ownership in the company 
And he also, due to this phone call and I would assume some sort of relationship that he's had where they deal with confidence that he was under the impression he could not trade on this information and he wanted out. So he was very upset, but eventually reached out to the investment bank that was representing mama.com to get some additional confidential details about the offering. But afterwards, he ended up calling his broker and instructed him to sell all his stake in the company in order to avoid ultimately $750,000 worth of losses, at which point the SEC brought an insider trading case under misappropriation theory. Okay. First question about that. Where was that case brought? I think it's an important fact in the Cuban case. Uh, that case was brought in the Fifth Circuit, specifically in Texas, which was ironic given his status as the Dallas Mavericks owner. What was the outcome? What happened in that case? So the outcome of the case was that the district court said that an agreement to keep information confidential does not necessarily include an agreement not to trade, and that a simple confidentiality agreement was insufficient to create a duty to disclose or abstain from trading. The SEC ultimately appealed, and the ultimate outcome is once it gets to the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals, they remand the case back down to say there was like at least plausible that both sides understood that there would be no trading on the information under which it, he could be brought under misappropriation theory. But once it was down back to trial court, he was actually acquitted by the jury. But so the important part, really, of this case is this idea that he says even on the phone, oh, no, I can't trade now that you've told me this. He's very aware that he is now holding material non-public information that will bind him to not being able to get out of this stock. I appreciate that. Like, really, the question is, like, is that establishing a relationship of confidence? He seems to very much be, be aware that he probably shouldn't be trading. And in spite that, he still is acquitted even when it does get remanded back by the Fifth Circuit. What are your thoughts about the Cuban case? One of the thoughts I had when reading this case, and when you look at a lot of these cases that are very similar, it's you always wonder if there's some sort of ulterior motive by the SEC, given them targeting big name for people like Mark Cuban or someone like Barry Switzer. A lot of these like quote unquote outsider trading cases really seem to um, hinge on celebrity status. But I think in this case, it is a little different just because he, especially on the phone call, makes it pretty clear that he has at least some sort of ascertainment that that information is confidential and that he can't trade on it. But it's one of those situations where I don't necessarily feel either way about it. It definitely seems like an overstep of what we would typically think of as misappropriating information. And if nothing else, it definitely feels far afield in some ways from where Pal was going in terms of the breach of duty in response or in connection to the transaction. Now we just have someone who gives you some information. There's some idea that maybe you should not be trading on that. It gets us actually a lot closer to disclose or abstain entirely, really, is where, is where I think this Cuban case is inching us closer to. As far as the celebrity status, that's interesting. As someone who practiced law in DC for a long time, that certainly was Cuban's thought that, like, you know, he's a celebrity and, and a number of other people who have a bit of a target on their back. Some of it justifiably, but there is, I think, certainly this un- thought that maybe the SEC enforcement attorneys are hoping to snag a big whale or something. That is definitely the feeling, I think, that certain defendants have. And Cuban very much felt that way and spent an enormous amount of money defending this case. Because he could. And so he really, on principle, didn't settle, didn't pay a fine, took it all the way to the end, really believing about the SEC was overreaching here, which he had the resources to do that and has very much been on kind of a crusade against the SEC as a result. Uh, He was always sort of lurking. That year, he went to SEC Speaks, which is a conference where a lot of the directors of the SEC discuss what they're working on. And he sat in his hoodie in the front row, perhaps to maybe intimidate some people, but it certainly made all of us securities lawyers in the room excited that there was a celebrity in our midst. So it kind of cuts both ways. Anyway, it's interesting about the Cuban case. Let's talk actually about another theory that's maybe derivative somewhat of misappropriation theory. And that's just actual straight 
outsider trading via hacking. So same concepts here. We have some breach somewhere, but without any actually even relationship. So tell us, I mean, the case that we've read about that, tell us a little bit about Derochko and what happens in that case and why that is yet another sort of next step in terms of SEC enforcement of insider trading. In the Derochko case, the defendant Derochko had opened up a brokerage account and had deposited a large sum of money. And subsequently, around the same time, IMS Health announced that they released their quarter three earnings during an analyst call later that month, and then hired a Thomson Financial to provide investor relations and web hosting services. And then on the date that that call was supposed to take place, an anonymous computer hacker had attempted to gain access into the earnings reports prior to the release, and then eventually was able to download the data before the call was made. And then within the same hour of that information being hacked, Drozco had purchased a bunch of put options in IMS Health that were set to expire at the end of the month, having never touched his account prior. And then after the earnings call, it had been known that the earnings per share of IMS Health were 28% below expectations, which ultimately caused the stock price to sink and allowed Drozco to sell all his options and make over $280,000 worth of profit. And his regular trading activity was noted by his brokerage account and reported to the SEC. Why is this different than typical insider trading? I think what makes this different from typical insider trading more so is he really is no duty whatsoever. He's just illegally obtaining information that we would think would be more akin to someone like the Department of Justice coming after him for his illegal activity as opposed to bring in an insider trading case. Right. So you have essentially a hacker. And, you know, I think the link here is that he has deceived someone. Isn't that sort of what the court ends up trying to wrestle with? Because if he hasn't deceived someone, then maybe we're not in insider trading, which seems like a sort of silly, maybe element, because at the end of the day, he's still trading on inside information. But they need to figure out, the court seems to be wrestling with whether or not he's being deceptive as he's obtaining this material, non-public information. Where does the court come out on that discussion? Yes. So they wrestle with the idea of whether computer hacking could be a deceptive device within the statute. And they ultimately decide that there's two types of computer hacking. One would be considered a deceptive device, which would be uh, falsifying identification and pretending to be or masquerading as another user. And then alternatively, there's exploiting a weakness in the code, which I guess would not fall under deceit in a way in which a case could be brought. And they ultimately determined that he misrepresented himself as another person such that they could apply misappropriation theory. Right. Okay. So I think all told where we are now over the entire arc of this semester and this podcast is that we are Inches away, again, from disclosure of stain. You have material non-public information. You can't trade on that, except that there is this wrinkle you need to show from misappropriation theory that you have obtained that information via deceit or breach of confidence or confidentiality or some way that you have obtained it. And again, where you've obtained that from, like the source of the information now is enough to have the breach of duty that we saw originally from Powell Powell would not have extended it this far. He still would have said that breach of duty needs to run to someone related to the transaction. But here we have even the next level, which is if you've hacked your way into it. But even the court here is saying, well, if you hacked in a way where you're not deceiving who you are, not hiding who you are, you just have exploited a weakness in the code, then one, that might not be deceptive, which I guess is arguable, but that then doesn't meet the elements for misappropriation theory, which... It's sort of uh, an interesting problem. It's what you know we got into a little bit in the last podcast and I think is relevant here, which is the brazen misappropriator. So someone walking up to you and saying, thank you for your material non-public information. I'm going to trade on it. Being completely transparent about their what they plan to do. Transparent about maybe even this idea that you don't expect I'm going to hold this in confidence. Then that's ironically not misappropriation then because you're aware of it. And so that I think 
adds as another sort of confusing wrinkle to insider trading law when we see how far we've come from maybe what the goals of the law are, what the regulations are, and then how they have evolved in practice makes it a little bit confusing here. What do you think about that? What is your thought on hackers as as eventual insider traders? It almost seems so far removed from how we would want to go about prosecuting a hacker. Personally, I think that hackers should be prosecuted under something different than insider trading, just because I I don't think it's within the same scope as how one typically thinks of insider trading, especially considering it's just like theft. It is misappropriation of material, not public information, but it's not not in a way that I, I think would make sense to bring under insider trading as opposed to some other statute. Okay. Well, let's talk about one last sort of additional, I don't know if I would call it shift or sort of extension of the law. And that is the more recent case that just came out this year. And it's fine if we don't have a ton of detail on it, but just I think the idea and the theory that the SEC is pushing here is one that's novel and very interesting. So what is it that you know about this concept of what is called shadow trading and whether or not, like, I'm curious to think, do you think that's a viable theory, if that's one that should be, that's an appropriate extension of insider trading law. But first, tell us what that is. What is this shadow trading that we saw in the Panawa case this year? In the Panawa case, shadow insider trading is essentially using information in order to connect the dots in a way in which you could predict how the market is going to react to that information becoming public. And that doesn't necessarily mean that the person has to trade directly on that company's information. And I think specifically in the Panama case, he has information by virtue of his company and then uses that confidential information to trade on a competitor because he believes that the acquisition of his company is going to increase their stock as well, given the industry that he's working in. Okay, it's almost like derivative information in some way. So he has some information that's inside and obviously material and non-public. He doesn't trade around that information about his his personal company, what he knows, but he does the math, it sounds like, and figures out that that's going to affect maybe a different company's stock price and trades in that. So we can see here now, again, we're extending all areas of insider trading First about, we extended sort of who the people are, the insiders, and who the breach of duty runs to. And now we're extending it somewhat in terms of what that information is about. To me, this is a very interesting new area that the SEC is pushing into. And I see how it can maybe logically make sense, but it does start to call into question a lot of what I think is maybe appropriate analyst work or other work to, to suss out you know, value for companies. What do you think about this? Is this something you think is an appropriate extension of insider trading regulation or is this crossing the line? What's your thought? To me, this seems like crossing the line, especially going back to the late Justice Powell's thoughts on allowing for analysts to uh, ferret out information and make decisions based off that. In this situation, I mean, he has... uh, other than working in the same industry, there's really no connection to the information he has and the companies that he's trading on to the point where it looks like just straight disclosure abstain in any situation where you have any information to a point that I think is not really necessary. Yeah. I mean, we will see. I, I mean, there's so much regulation around in some of this industry. And so maybe there are appropriate guardrails such that this would maybe only catch sort of a certain number of bad actors. But to me, it does seem that this is getting a little bit, as you say, far afield, certainly than what Justice Powell had intended. And in fact, this very much flies in the face of what Justice Powell, I think, would have said, because he very much narrowed insider trading regulation for this purpose of trying to find adequate sort of price discovery, allowing analysts to suss out information. He would have, I think, applauded this (laughs) trader rather than set out an enforcement action. So that's just my two cents. I'm not going to, to be brazen enough to speak for Justice Powell, but, but it does, I think, strike me as you know an interesting place where we are. So looking forward, now that the semester's ended and we have 
wrapped up everything we need to know about insider trading law. What is it you think, Andrew, is the solution, if any? Where would you like to see insider trading regulation go? Or would you like to have it go away? What is your takeaway from all of this? Depends on the day, to be honest. Sometimes I believe there needs to be almost akin to disclosure abstain. And sometimes I understand, fail to understand why there's any regulation at all. It's constant struggle of whether... I don't think that the current landscape is adequate for insider trading. I think that there definitely needs to be like on point statute that clearly defines insider trading, hopefully in a way that can encapsulate the different classical theories, misappropriation theories, and then some form of like outsider trading. But there's definitely a, a, mor- a morass of different legal opinions that make it way too confusing in its current state. I would agree, but it is. Maybe for your career, the gift that keeps on giving, because there's a lot of confusion. People need a lot of lawyers around it. But um, we shall see. As we looked at in our last class, there is pending legislation maybe that's passed the House and we're waiting to see what happens to it in the Senate. But as we looked at it, we realized it might not actually solve a whole lot of problems with the way it is currently worded. It, It somewhat codifies what we already have through common law. But We will keep our eyes out to see if there are other ways that maybe we can try to add clarity and some understanding around insider trading law. I hope that this semester gave you some, at least, background, but I don't know if we all have achieved actual clarity because I don't think there is much to be found sometimes in insider trading law. But Andrew, thanks for being with me today. This has been a delight. I've learned a lot from you, so I appreciate it. If you have any other parting thoughts, I welcome them. If not, we uh, will sign off. Yeah, no other parting thoughts. Thank you for having me. Thanks for being here.